Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 252, that's Dos Cinco Dos. Hope you guys are doing well, hope you guys are doing fine. Good. How am I? Pretty good, man, pretty good. I just got back from the gym, had a very strong, strenuous workout, lifted a couple of weights, did some overhead presses. Did some bench presses, did some uh, back squats, did some push-ups, and a few sit-ups, and now I'm here. And then after work today, because it's double workout Fridays, I'm going to go for a three-mile-plus run. It might be four, it might be five. Haven't decided just yet, but I'm probably going to go on a long run. And I've got the perfect accompaniment in terms of music, too. Two albums dropped today that I want to quickly talk to you about. Um, first Styles Peace Presence, which is out now. Check that out. One of my favorite rappers. Um, somebody that, you know, you essentially I, I listened to most of this back to front in the gym this morning. Perfect kind of thing if you want to listen to something when you're lifting really heavy weights. Then the second album I'm going to listen to when I'm running because it's a little bit more mellow, a little bit more introspective. Makes me, um, you know, tear up a little bit inside because I miss the dude in terms of an artist. Is Little Peeps, Everybody's Everything. So far, I've listened to the first five or six tracks and I can easily say that Little Peeps Estate is doing a far better job of handling um, his post hominis or have you pronounce that word releases um, as opposed to maybe XX Tentacion's um, side of things. Maybe it's because Little Peep has a lot more raw material to work with maybe more of the songs were done prior to his passing i'm not sure what it is but there's a real difference in terms of the quality of output that's come out on either sides of the situation again super distressful so i don't really um i don't really have anything against the, the guys and how they brought out the stuff with x but you can definitely tell that little peep had so much has so much um material that was nearly finished or close to being finished that they were able to kind of you know clean up and kind of tie up the loose ends of and again it just makes you a bit sad isn't it, that he died in such unfortunate circumstances and it seems as if you know um you saw it happen a little bit with um there's a few other people that overdose isn't it? i forgot who, who survived but usually these lessons don't last long in it i think that's why people don't really get that you know introspective about them when people do pass due to um alcohol or drug abuse um because if you're really about that life, you're not gonna you're not gonna stop if somebody else decides to kind of kick it or kick the can or you know someone has an unfortunate episode where they get laced with drugs that have been laced with fentanyl. So if you're not necessarily gonna give it up, you're just gonna continue doing it and hope that you don't get caught out. So um, that's a shame, really. But you know what can you do? Uh, so a bit of a macabre way to start a podcast. So I apologize, but anyway, check those albums out. Uh, Little Peep and uh, Styles P, two of my favorites out at the moment. And of course, the last one, last but not least, this actually leaked the other day, um, a day a day earlier, but it should be out now on all your streaming services. Uh, Tory Lane's Chick Tape Five. Oh my God! If you're a fan of early two thousands R and B, if you're a fan of, if you remember listening to Deja Vu FM back in the day. And I'm um, listening to Entertainment Crew play like two hours full of just the best 90s to 2000s R&B. Then you'll know exactly what the situation is with this um, album. Amazing samples. He was, I don't know how he was able to clear some of the stuff. It must have cost him an arm and a leg. He's probably not even making any money on this album as it stands. So as, a, as an exercise of... As an exercise in creativity, I think you should support him. He's got a shanty on the cover here. You know, real, uh, really kind of harking back to the old days. Um, she's even got one of those um, old phones that they used to use back in the oh, two two ways. That two way, the kind of like sidewards, the horizontal sort of phone people were using. Posters in the corner. People don't have posters anymore in their room, in it. I don't think so. Do teenage girls or teenage? It's a teenage girl thing usually, isn't it? Boys usually have posters if you're a fan of sports. I wonder if girls still have posters in their room. Probably not, in it. Probably spending all your time staring at the screens. No need for that. But yeah, it's a really amazing mixtape. I mean, album. Sorry, I think it's an album. It's official release. Probably out on uh, stream platforms to buy and stuff. So. Definitely support the kid. Like I said, I don't think he's making any money on this, um, Tory Lanez, because the amount of samples on here is insane. There's like 16 tracks, not including skits. I think there's a couple of skits here and there, which again, I'm not a fan of his skits, but I think if you're a Tory Lanez fan, you just have to accept that he's going to include skits. It's just his thing. He likes doing it, but it's not for me. It's probably done a bit better on here than it has done in his previous albums. They usually, they usually like a little snippet at the beginning or the end of the track. No, usually at the end, end of the track, I think, for the most part. Um, standout track for me so far that I haven't um, I haven't listened to everything on here just no I've listened to you I have listened to everything haven't I no I've, I've still got about five or so tracks to go but I think the favorite so far might be the get the let's get blown um, sample which is called blows blown blowing minds num track number five that's one of my favorites 
Um, Love Your Girls, one of my favourites too, number nine. And yes, sir. But so far, I've not listened to everything, so there'll probably be some other ones that might stand out. But definitely recommend you check those out. Tory Lane's Chick Tape 5, Styles P, Presence, and Little Peep, Everybody's Everything. Three albums that I am definitely going to bang out for the rest of this weekend. So, the weekend has arrived, you filthy mofo, because it's Friday. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are hydrating, all that stuff. I'm sure some of you guys are waiting for the clock to tick down to until 5 p.m. at your workplace so you can then chuck you know close your laptop push your chair under your table run out into the nearest bar and drink yourself silly hope you guys are going to do that hope you guys have fun not sure what the climate is in terms of clubbing this weekend i haven't checked anything on resident advisor but i'm sure there might be some events out there that you guys are going to be really down to go of course fold uh oh today's an epic day for fold isn't it right d-day so we're going to find out whether or not fold has um been successful in getting their license kind of reinstated because of the you know um tricky situation they're in where somebody that invested or helped to start up the club um was acquired their money in illegitimate ways it seems from what the police are saying so again it's not it's not nothing to do with fold which is good i think so far we've learned reading between the lines that the local council had no real issue with fold there were a few complaints about noise but nothing really crazy which made sense because i remember going to again i've been fold a few times and each time i've been it seems like they really have a real um firm grip on the situation there they don't let anyone fuck around um if you're i've seen people get in there really wasted and the, the security guards have gone out their way to kind of help the person up get them some water escort them outside get their friends you know what i mean like they, they really take care of people it's not just a kind of you know get the fuck out of here and kind of you know figure shit out yourself they're really kind of wholesome in that regard and in in general they have really created you know people like to say they create a safe space no they have actually have created a safe space so i think they should be okay fingers crossed but again i'm not sure how um the police treat these kind of things you know once you've got somebody in your business who's doing illegitimate things maybe they just it's a black mark against you forever and maybe as well as a negative consequence um you know sometimes you can slip by the you can slip under the radar i think the vision's done that for a while visions for like i don't know maybe close to a decade had some like crazy fucking license that allowed them to stay open until 6 a.m and of course the the res the actually the customers ruined it themselves because they started fighting and shit and attracting um police attention but you probably they probably got away with that because you know the license was signed you know years ago when another with another councilman was in charge or somebody else done a favor for them and no one really updated it or really paid it too much mind but then once you start attracting the attention of the police more eyes get on you and then people start to look into what you're actually doing how you're running the operation and they're like you know what why have you guys got a license till 6 a.m and then suddenly they start kind of tweaking it and i think that might have happened Maybe in the beginning as well, Fold, because you remember they did, they did build Fold as the first 24-hour nightclub, and it's not really 24 hours, is it really? But you know, it's a good way to kind of promote it. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we get some good news from Fold. But if not, you, sh you, you still have loads of other options to go and club at. Most of them aren't as good as Fold, but, you know, especially East London, you've got Mix, you've got Yard. Um, South, you've got a, lot, a few others, a few other kind of uh, bar places like Tollers and all that sort of stuff that are open that people can go to. So I'm sure you guys should be fine. <clears throat> anyway. Let's get into some topics, loads of stuff to talk about, loads of stuff that I'm interested in. Um, I think um, first things first, maybe in terms of a uh, DJ type type of news, there's new uh, new news in terms of equipment stuff, right? So uh, yeah, let's go to equipment news first. So as you guys are aware, I'm a DJ myself. Usually, you know, most of the time I'm DJing at local bars and clubs and stuff. So nothing too crazy at the moment. But hopefully over time, I'm going to start um, investing in some production equipment as well. Just some basic shit. Start producing, get my name out there. And hopefully I can kind of raise my profile. But for the most part, whenever I go and uh, play in these bars and clubs and DJ, usually the equipment's pretty shitty, right? Um, which is no fault of the bar or club. Usually because the level that I'm playing at, they have so many people coming through there playing music so many people who are of varying levels of experience varying levels of giving a shit so the equipment really gets tested right it really gets beaten and battered and the reason it does is because for the most part djs come and just plug and play whatever's available if you're a professional dj for the if for, for the most part if you're a professional dj where you you know you make your main income from djing you usually have a rider that, <coughs> that gets sent out to clubs to make sure they have the equipment that you need in order to kind of do a good job and other DJs have the same thing too. So because of that, DJs are consistent. I mean, the venues are consistently having to make sure that they are running maintenance on their equipment. Because, you know, the last thing you want as a club is to book a DJ for a thousand pound and shit and then have he, him, or, him, or he, him or her play a set and, you know, it go completely tits up because your mixer doesn't work or because your turntables are fucked up, right? So you got to make sure your equipment is in tip-top shape 
to make the DJ's job hard easy, to make sure the sound engineer doesn't have to come running out from the back and unplugging shit, to make sure the punters have a good time, and to make sure the DJ has a good time too, so they come back the next time, right? Everything works in general. But in bars and clubs, it doesn't really work that way. Sometimes equipment is really shoddy. And in other places, they don't have any equipment because usually the bars and clubs don't see any reason why they should invest in, you know, a thousand plus um, CDJs, like Pioneer Nexus CDJs or whatever, plus a mixer, plus a soundboard, plus a, um, a PA system and speakers and stuff. It just doesn't seem viable for a lot of bars and clubs, especially the ones around the area that I live in. But something I've been thinking about doing for a while is buying these, is buying one of these all-in-one uh controllers similar to the thing that i've got but the one that i've got is more so like a bedroom dj thing that i just used to make mixes on it's something you could probably take outside that will kind of you know run the test of time or you know be able to kind of hack a lot of people batting bashing it and fucking up and shit but i really wanted to buy like a really big all-in-one system to have at home and also for the occasion where i want to throw my own parties in local bars and clubs around here in Stratford. And then in the hope that also by showing them this all-in-one system, the buying club could be like, you know what? We should invest a couple of grand in this because it's an easy money maker for them, right? Because if they if they wanted to get a DJ to come in or someone to play, they can just play on this system. And they've also got an option to, you know, they've also got an option to kind of um, allow maybe the possibility to kind of get their bar and club a bit more foot traffic, a bit more people in there. But for the most part, the bars and clubs I have around here don't really need that. You know, you're in the middle of Shefford. You have quite a decent amount of people coming to your bar anyway, especially the ones here. Most of the people that attend um, kind of frequent it on the weekend, especially during the season, are West Ham fans. You know, they make enough money as it is. Probably don't need another bull ache of having a DJ um, sitting in the corner playing fucking shitty songs. But I think personally, as a DJ coming up and trying to do things and trying to perfect my craft, it's also a good way to kind of practice at home with equipment that is quite similar to what you will play in a nightclub. It's not one for one. But it's the closest thing you're going to get. It's probably close. It's, it's much closer to what you're going to see in a DJ booth in a club um, as opposed to the MIDI players that people usually have. And another good example of this is the Pioneer DJ XDJ XZ. These, these names of them are horrible, isn't it? So XDJ XZ by Pioneer just released. And it's an all-in-one controller with four channels. I think there's another one that I used when I played in an art gallery a couple of months ago that was um, a two-channel mixer that I've seen a lot of people using so while. But this is the first one I've seen as a four-channel mixer. I think there's a few other DJs out there who've been complaining about that and want a bit more functionality, the ability maybe to plug in other systems, maybe the ability to maybe plug in a couple of turntables just to kind of make it a little bit more expansive. Um, I think the four-channel mixer thing, I'm not really that bothered about. Again, I just think um, the idea of uh, being able, or maybe if you're playing back to back or there's a couple of more DJs playing, it might be a good example to do that. But I think just the ability to have a system that allows you to play on a pioneer turntable that's similar to what you'd get in a Connect Club is probably the best thing ever out there. And this XDJ thing looks pretty cool. So article on it, a mix that kind of details the new mixer just released and a few other youtubers have kind of been out there especially the review guys have put some really cool reviews out there about the system so I definitely recommend you check it out but let me read this article to you quickly um so the pioneer dj's new xdj xz controller has arrived the four channel mixer is compatible with serato this will come in the firmware update in 2020 and record box offering jog displays 14 professional beat fx and a six sound color fx and two separate mic inputs which is sick if you're one of those kind of DJs to get on the mic the xdj xz mimics club setups and offers many of the features that nxs2 club djs use by offering a seven inch display and also free usb inputs that will make back-to-back -back sets and dj changeovers a little bit easier which is fucking awesome right that's always the kind of annoying thing about when you're dj back to back like how do you swap over all times i've played and you have people that want to plug into your channel that you're already playing in just gets a bit haywire so the ability to plug in free usbs is a really good um option and i'm sure it'll be popular at those um what are those events you know those events and, oh you know after parties in Ibiza. Or just after parties in people's apartments anyway in general. They're quite cool. You can just get people to kind of plug in their USBs and just keep rolling um, again and again and again. The controller also has a feedback reducing feature for use with mics that automatically reduces any howling sounds that might arise. So again, it's a pretty hefty system. It looks really weighty. It's got some really big rotund feet at the bottom of it as well to make sure it's stable. Um, it looks really sturdy. I think it's made out of metal as well, so no plastic on there. There's a little video here we can quickly check out from uh, Pioneer that details some of the features on there. Let's check that out. Is that DJ Emil? I hate that let well wear DJ actually. It's so annoying, isn't it? But hey, it's usually choosing it well. Professional quality in one unit. 
It looks really, really weighty, and it? it actually, you know what? It actually looks very professional. I gotta be honest. It doesn't look like a toy. It looks very, very professional. There's something about it that looks super solid, especially from the the point of view of the mixer. You can definitely tell that this is a really sturdy unit. I'm down for it, man. But I think it's like two grand, isn't it? It's fucking expensive as fuck. So again, you know, save up a couple of months to pay. Probably get yourself one. Two. What does it say there? Four channel mix. Oh, go away. These annotations are so annoying, isn't it? Let's take that off there. Um, four channel mixer. Two m mix. Two internal channels with a multiple external sources. Okay, so the, the four channel mixer doesn't actually work with the USB stick. So you still have to. So the other. So I think channel one and two come from a USB stick, and then channel three and four come from the, another output. So like like a laptop or something, or right another turntable, which is annoying. You, know, you can't necessarily play free tracks and yeah that's the only bullshit bit about it so why would you want that then how do you change i don't know why you'd want that if you, why would you want one and two coming from usb and three and four coming from a laptop or external hydro that makes no sense doesn't it 14 beat fx there's an x pad as well on there fx frequency which everyone loves to use connect two external sources okay that's a nice couple of turntables a laptop a record box so lot of dj pro Am I, um, is it me or do I like to, I kind of prefer when I use um, USB turntables to just use a USB. I don't necessarily want to plug in my laptop. I think as a DJ, you should be doing all your prep at home on the laptop and making sure that your tunes sound correct and you've got all the cue points where you want them to be and stuff. But you should be doing all your research and your, you know, your R&D at home on the laptop. And I think when you go to a, a nightclub and you go and play, you should be fully immersed in the experience and kind of just lock in. And just kind of like keep attention on the actual turntables you're playing because there's nothing worse than when you're at a club and stuff especially in america they do it more in america they love americans love having a fucking laptop staring at them in front right in front of them too they don't even they don't even put it to a side um because you've seen some european DJs are quite cool and they just do if they're going to use a laptop they kind of put it to the side and they kind of always load the screen when they're in between mixes so you're not always staring at the, staring at it but i don't know i quite like the idea of just plugging it in a usb it kind of makes it or it's already quite a digital experience isn't it right um, your, your bloody um, digitally analyzing your tracks, you know, setting the BPM automatically, uh, um, including cue points where you want, uploading it or downloading it into your um, USB stick. So it's fairly f a seamless uh, transition. It's a seamless kind of, you know, uh, way to get your music onto USB. So if there's anything you want it to make it a bit analog and to make it a bit real and to make it a bit more, you know, authentic, like you'd want to have the DJ just locked in and be actually listening to the tracks fully and try to understand what's what's off beat, what's on beat, whether or not that because sometimes your tracks get analyzed on on reticle box and sometimes it's not even quantized the right way, right? The BPMs are one way, but then when you play it, you actually know by ear that that is a bit slower, or a bit faster than what that BPM says. So you're having to kind of constantly fuck around and you know move shit around and make sure it's where it needs to be. And you can only do that by just immersing yourself and not having the laptop screen staring at you. But again, maybe it's just me, but I, I kind of prefer not having a laptop in the club. If I want to get from DJ with a, with a USB stick, I was trying to use my USB stick only. And sometimes you go to a club. How many times have you been DJing and you uh, spend loads of time preparing a playlist right? or preparing like a, uh, a crate or whatever it may be, you analyze some tracks, you've got some good selection of tracks in there, a good bit of, or even sometimes you throw in a little, a little random crate that you just want to throw in some, you know, some curveballs, and then you get to a club, you've got a perfect time to play it, and you forgot to fucking rip it. You're so preoccupied with, with ripping other stuff, you forgot to download that stuff. There's nothing worse, but I think in those occasions, the best of you comes out, because sometimes you might be relying on something as a crux, you realize you don't have it, and then you're having to make other adjustments, and suddenly, you, ha you have a much better set, as opposed to sitting on, with having your laptop there with your entire library of, of tunes, you're going to get that paralysis by analysis thing. It's just, there's just like, um, you know, there's an option fatigue, right? There's just too many options there. You're just going to not make any choice. That's my opinion anyway, I think. I'm not sure. Remember, I'm not right. Let's continue with the video. Play back to back sets really well. I like the little LSD screen for an instinctive control. Pretty cool color on jog displays, view waveforms and hot cues and BPM. I don't really need that personally. I think I would just like to have the display on the screen. I don't need the display on the jog wheel. That makes it look look a bit naff. That's the only thing I'm not really a fan of, but you know, that's just me maybe. But I like it, man. It looks fucking solid, isn't it? Keep an eye on the important track information. Cool. Six sound color effects. Add texture to your mix as well, which is nice. Too many effects in this, but again, it's a promo video, isn't it? But 16 color pad performance pads as well. Okay, 
Okay, nice. She's going for it. She's fucking smashing it to be fair. Full size advanced jog wheels as well. That's nice. That's the one good thing about these kind of controllers. That's the one thing I learned when I. That's why I kind of upgraded my my MIDI controller at home to at least a kind of a pretty decent Pioneer one. But I remember when I had the shitty Newmark ones or a few others before. They used to have the most tiniest or weirdest jog wheel size. So then when you went to a nightclub, or even sometimes the, um, uh, the pitch was just so strange, so small, so tiny. By the time you went to a nightclub and you were actually on a, on a full-size CDGA, you just didn't know how to control it. It was just, the, the jog wheel felt like the size of your hand. You felt scared nudging your record and stuff, and you felt scared pitching up or pitching down. It's just so much range to go from. So that's the one thing I like about these units, because it gets you used to just where things can be and kind of the size of things, because that's essentially what you need. Isn't it? When you're practicing at home, you want to feel like when you're practicing at home it's what you're doing when you're playing in a nightclub you don't want to feel it like it's a big disconnect but yeah this is some things feels looks, looks pretty cool i'm a fan of it man i definitely would wouldn't mind having one myself but two grand Woo! a lot of money perfect for music venues perfect for mobile events definitely for yeah bar mitfis and wesley and shit private studios definitely for sure i agree with that one and the two mic inputs, independent free band EQs. I'm pretty sure maybe if you even, even an online radio station and you've got tons of people playing in there and there's people that don't really look after their, you know, their equipment, um, that might be a good way to kind of, you know, use, um, to, that, that might be a good place to use that sort of stuff, right? It's a bit more robust, all in one unit, maybe. I don't know what people would say that on radio station. Maybe they prefer just to have the legit thing. Oh, actually, you know what? Talking about um, taking care of your equipment, because, you know, that's it. You can check it out. It's available now. The Pioneer XDJ uh, XZ. Talking about making look after your equipment. Do you remember that video of Black Madonna fucking smashing a mixer? That's one of my favorite videos to see. Like, the memes on that were incredible. Black Madonna mixer. <laughs> Let me see if I can do it. I can find it. Boiler room mix. Let me see it. Uh, 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 da, 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 da. Black Madonna. Boiler room. Crossfade, that's it. Well, yeah. Her fucking up the crossfader. Do you remember seeing that? This is the video of it. Where is it? Okay, here it is. <laughs> it is from um, Black Madonna's back to back set with Mike Servito from Boiler Room Deck Mantle Festival three years ago. But there's a particular video here where somebody clipped it that she's absolutely smashing the mixer. This is this is every kind of v venue or bar manager's worst nightmare, man. Like, she's. I don't know who plays like this. Have you ever seen anyone do this? Like, actually forcefully, like bang 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 the, the crossfade like this i've never seen it before in my life i think the only person that i've seen kind of really go aggressive with the channels and shit is maybe ricardo Vero lobos he loves doing that kind of dun 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 dun. he switches the, the channels from side to side up and down that's that's kind of like an old school detroit thing isn't it that a lot of detroit DJs do back in the day even jeff mills has that kind of like style where he's sort of like ferret uh doing his little ferret touches with, with the channels but, 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 but i've never seen anyone like go bang 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 maybe old school garage these days or grand back in the day i'm not sure Mac 10 and stuff. Oh yeah, Mac 10 did that. Remember when we booked Mac 10 at the Alibi for so special? Mac 10 was really aggressive, but he was doing a MIDI player. He did his own thing. But he was really, really kind of like smashing those channels. But this is a video of Black Madonna giving no fucks about the condition of the of the crossfader and who might play next. She a legend regardless, but look at this, look at this. Jesus Christ. Look at it. The whole mixer is, is moving. Jesus Christ. No way is that the original audio. Is that the original audio? No way that's the original audio. No way that's the original audio. That can't be original audio. Oh my god. Is that the original audio? Let me see. Somebody must have this on the timestamps. Let me see if someone's got this. That can't be the original audio. That is insane. Black Madonna, what are you doing? Okay, it's hurting pancakes there behind the booth. You know, it is what it is. Okay, cool. There we go. RSP crossfader. Let's see. We've got we've got the clip here. Mama mia. Surely that's not true. Okay, it wasn't tragedy. Okay, there we go. It's that. Why is she doing that for her anyway? It's a weird way to mix, isn't it? I think she's just fucking around maybe, right? Okay, maybe she was fucking around. I'm not too sure. But she was just actually mixing and taking care of the tracks and making sure things come in at a certain time, but... That hurts my eyes. I can't look at that anymore, man. That's, that's, that, that makes me just like curl up and die. The amount of places I've been to where the, the, 
Number one, every place I've been to, the knobs on the mixer are always missing. So you're having to take a knob off from like a some a feature you're not going to use and put in another one. <laughs> and making sure it works the right way. Or the effects button is completely smushed in so you can't press it to like, okay, cool, no effects today. Or the pitch thing is, you know, there's no knob on that one. So you have to move it with your finger. Like there's always something happening or one, or one mix. Or what, yeah, there's, I've, there's another issue I've had. Once one deck has had that thing where you the, every time you put a cue point, it skips a couple of bars in front. Wherever you set the cue point, it just jumps in front. So you're having to set the cue point back and then have it jump where you want it to be. Or just do the old school style like a vinyl and just basically release it when you want uh, on a four beat count. But fucking hell, man. Not for me, man. That that just make, that make, that just hurts my feelings. I'm not even the owner. It's not even anything to do with me. But again, big up Black Madonna, man. Absolute legend. But she absolutely abused that crossfader. Gave it no love whatsoever. <laughs> um, next on the list here. Let's move on. Too much to talk about. Let's go. Number two. Oh. This is really cool. Um, APC have collaborated with Jound. It's maybe has to be. It has to be up there with maybe the most, the most, the most on brand, the most um, harmonious, and the most uh, perfect collaboration I've probably seen in a long, long time. Especially off the back of rumors about Jordan collaborating with Dior and all this sort of bullshit. If any, if if ever there was a synergy in terms of uh, aesthetic, in terms of um, design codes, in terms of just you know appreciation for each other's work i definitely say abc and jound if you're familiar with uh, jound you would know that or if you're not familiar jound is an image mood board blog thing that started a few years ago by this guy called justin saunders who's now affiliated with kanye and virgin all those kind of guys and essentially it was kind of my go-to place for um you know just a kind of temperature check on what's going on currently in culture even though it was mostly Justin's vision of what he kind of like his aesthetic. There was loads of really uh, cool architecture, loads of... Actually, let me just put it up here on screen so you guys can see it yourself. But I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of what Jand is. Loads of cool images of um, vehicles, um, interior, art, architecture, design bits and pieces. Loads of kind of interesting, you know... Um, miscellaneous items that you would be down for but just a really cool image again the image mood board it came during the era of maybe it was kind of pre-instagram so that kind of idea of creating you know some some instagram influencers have those uh, feeds where there's loads of really cool um uh really refined pictures of you know plants and really exotic locations this was maybe uh that me this maybe predated that to some extent and again it was a really clever way of justin to kind of um showcase his design aesthetic without being too shouty or without being too boasty if anything you know what it reminded me of it reminded me a little bit of when asap yams had that blog where he basically used it as an opportunity to um promote asap rocky and, and asap mobs work without being without it being intrinsic without people being aware that it was actually somebody that was managing or that was you know kind of uh, setting the tone of being the creative director of ASAP Mob doing it. That was a really clever way of doing it, right? So Justin Saunders had his blog, loads of really cool images, and then in between here and there, he'd post an odd thing that he was making himself, whether it would be a particular hoodie, whether it would be some trainers, or it would be the cut of his jeans. And that kind of fr that kind of um, gave a little bit of le legitimacy behind it. And of course, some collaboration did afterwards kind of, you know, added to that way as well. But as you can see with the aesthetic, you know, loads of nice real pale tones, loads of really good simplistic stuff very contemporary, very modern. So it made complete sense that they'll collaborate with APC, especially knowing if you know anything about Justin Saunders, you know that he's a, a complete, you know, psycho about Levi's and APC denim. So that's, when I saw this collaboration, I was super happy for the dude because I'm sure this is definitely a, a collaboration that he was probably dreaming about. And now the lookbook has finally come out and we've got some details about some of the items included. And it looks fucking incredible, really, to be honest. Um, it's what you'd expect from a John APC collection. Loads of um, really neutral colors, loads of really clean designs designs again the, the devil's going to be in the detail of a lot of this stuff you have to have it to hand to kind of appreciate it i'm sure that he geeked out about the weight of the yarn about the finishes on the cuff about the particular hue and color how it washes like all those details are going to be something that you're going to have to live with but i think all, overall just from what i've seen on the screen so far it looks incredible so let's go through the lookbook there's a really cool lookbook here with a dude holding a dog um the jumper here has got a kind of is it is it in, it's not embossed it's sort of like a raised down in script uh, handwriting kind of style across the front of the jumper i'm sure the jumper cut has been done to precise um it has got some sort of influence behind it i love that the cuffs are really long and extended that's again is that more of a 70s thing right um the arms aren't as the, the arms aren't as short as they would have been maybe or puffy as some of the other 70 sweatshirts but i like the fact that they're really really long so you can kind of roll them up a little bit kind of similar to people where they used to roll up the sleeves of their um or the cuff sorry of their bape jumpers so you can rebuild the back 
of the babe head. That was quite a little cool thing that people used to do back in the day. So I like that little touch there. Um, next image, you have, uh, again, some really cool... The jeans are great because, um, again, I'm I'm pretty sure it's just a kind of like, you know, uh, two designers geeking out of each other, but I like that they allowed um, Jound to put Jound essentially on the back leather pocket of the jeans instead of APC, which is really cool addition there. Um, again, you must have geeked out on there. And on the right-hand side, you've got this amazing... Is it a nylon bag on the right-hand side? A really cool size... Um, again, a bag, a kind of everyday bag that you can use, and you know the classic uh, John aesthetic, a, a sweatshirt, a sweatshirt tracksuit um, with a great back pocket, which you know I've always used on sweatshirts. Actually, I've, I'm, you know what I'm a big fan of. I'm, I'm not a big fan of sweat, of sweatpants that have pockets with zips on them. It always, you know, it's always kind of rubs against you because you're naturally. I don't know why, but you always kind of when I'm wearing sweatsuits or tracks, I'm always got my hands in my pockets, and I love when the sweatpants have really exaggerated, massive pockets. I remember I had one pair of sweatpants I bought. It might have been a Gilded one or some other style. I, I regret not having them anymore because I, I cut them into shorts and then they're ripping. But they had these pockets that essentially came down maybe up to your knee. They were insanely big. Um, but you could fit anything in there, right? So you ended up walking around the street with these massive balloons on the side of your legs. But I love the aesthetic. So I like the fact that they don't have any zips in the pockets. And they also have the addition of the back pocket, which I always used to kind of chuck in a pair of keys or whatever it may be. Um, uh, yeah, you've got the sweatshirt in black. And then it's got APC on the front of the sleeve. You've got the um, Jown logo, which looks maybe a little bit similar to Champion. Maybe that's where the inspiration come from. The sort of like script of Champion kind of done in a Jown. Well, the, yeah, the Champion logo instead like done in a Jown style. And again, black sweatsh- uh, gray, a mild gray sweatshirt, which I'm sure he was obsessed over. Because if you know Jown again on the mood board, he's always obsessing over uh, different different styles of mild gray sweatshirt. So this must have been a really cool moment for him in that regard. And then you've got another image of the black track suit as well. Sorry, the black sweatsuit hoodie with some nice drawstrings there. A, a pair of light blue denim jeans, I'm sure are going to be super popular. This That color of jean has been... The standout color i've seen so far on the streets i'm not sure what's going on I'm not sure what who started that trend but i've seen a, the amount of girls i've seen wearing or especially wearing these kind of color jeans like essentially you know light blue washed out um color of jeans with no with no uh slits on her knee or anything i've seen more girls wearing that color than anything oh, especially high-waisted and they usually have a frayed um cuffs um i like that they don't have oh, frayed hem sorry i like that they don't have them on these Maybe they're selfish, maybe they're not. I'm not sure if the sneakers are included in the collaboration as well, but they look pretty cool. Um, very um, simple, kind of like dad style trainers you got there. And in the last two slides, you have a nice big tote bag. Oh, the shoes look amazing. Isn't it? I'm not sure if the shoes are included. They're essentially like, um, what do you call those shoes? Underground creepers, right? Similar to those kind of style shoes. Some nice stiff uh, selfish denim, indigo denim jeans there. A nice massive tote bag that APC is always famous for. And John does a really good job as well for that. That sweatshirt looks really cool. I like the cut of that sweatshirt. It sits really, really well. I'm sure this is gonna sell out like fucking hotcakes. Um, there's a, some images here of the items in the line sheet for you guys to check out as well. But you can see that in the link below and a cool little video here too from ABC Paris. Some of the behind the scenes footage looks fucking cool, man. I love it. I'm all over it. Definitely all over it. I want to see what it looks like. The IRL interaction for. What does that mean? It's the fourth collection of APC and John. I'm pretty sure I thought it was the first one. Um, it's today. John invite you to celebrate the launch of APC Interaction 4, November 14th, 7 p.m. at the shop in Mercer. Talk between... Oh, there's going to be a, an actual talk as well with um, John then... Uh, with John... John Tutu. Tutu? Tutu? How do you pronounce it? John Tutu? I don't know how you pronounce his name. And John, that's 7th. It was there yesterday anyway, so maybe someone's recorded it. Definitely check that out. The collection has dropped yesterday too on the 14th. Not sure if all of it's going to be available right now. We can actually check it on the shop now and see if it's actually available. Is it available to buy still? Is it available on his site or is it can you only buy it from their site? Oh, it's available on his site too, but it's all sold out as per usual. I'm not surprised. But yeah, everything's sold out. And I, well, most of the t-shirts are sold out, but the sweatshirt's still there. Two eighty dollars. Sweatpants are two ten. The backpack is still available. The tote. It's interesting the stuff that sells out in it. The tote bag is sold out. Um, the keychain is sold out, and that's it. And a couple of t and one t-shirt. Everything else is still available. So definitely recommend you check it out. A really cool collection and i'm sure um john or justin is really happy with this as well that's a, probably a dream collab isn't it you go from blogging about a brand and obsessing over the internet and then suddenly you get the opportunity to make a, collab- a collaboration with them yourself and use their resources it's just fucking incredible so yeah big up to him 
and hope that sells out sooner rather than later next on the list what do we have here du, 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 du. What else we have here? Oh, um, we got news from Hype Beast that there's going to be another another Sakai and Nike waffle racer. Um, this is something that I like and don't like about Nike on the same part. I think Nike do a really good job in terms of um, giving brands the ability to go into their archives or giving them permission to go to their archives, pull out shoes that maybe aren't in line with their overall marketing push and allow them to do their own thing right because sometimes in the big i think in the beginning or in the early stages there was a hierarchy of the terms of brands and what they were allowed to do and what brands and what shoes they were allowed to retro or bring back or what designs they were allowed to fuck with and shit but then over time i think with the prevalence of sneaker you know sneaker culture being a billion dollar industry and streetwear just blowing up all over the world and it becoming just you know power of course for the young generation nowadays i think brands have now understood that sometimes the best thing to do in a collaboration is to just let the collaborator do what they want to do in it because they're already bringing a pre-made audience to your brand the people that are going to buy nike and ideas always exist but the extra bump that they get of sellouts usually comes because of sakai fans wanting to buy a pair of shoes that are maybe with nike as opposed to just buying a nike shoe so you might as well let them you know have the freedom of the factory um and also it's cool as well because like i said um, sometimes brands have their own schedule of releases and stuff that they want to promote and market and sometimes they'll use brands as a way to kind of get the shoe more exposure, like start off making a collaboration. Like, you know, the the Nike Reacts um, Element 87s was a good example of those, right? They basically um, used Undercover's name and brand exposure and, you know, uh, relevance in the sneaker game to kind of, you know, expose and market and advertise that shoe to a bigger audience. And then over time, they phased out that that or that first collection of collaborations sold out and then they kind of brought out some gr pairs but it's usually done in quite it's usually done quite close together back to back they don't give it time to breathe which is something that's annoying for me because well for most sneakers because i guess when you buy an undercover and nike collab you're buying it because you know some undercover nike collab you want that special thing and it kind of devoids the specialness because within a space of a couple of months nike are going to bring out a gr version of that shoe or they're going to get undercover and give them more money and just pump out loads of other designs. As we're seeing with the Sakai shoes, right? They dropped essentially, I think it might be up to close to 10 pairs of shoes now so far, right? Including the blazers of the different colors of the, of the LD waffle. And it's just, you're a bit fatigued by it now, isn't it? Like how many times have you seen people walking around with a pair of, it's a good thing because you actually see people wearing the shoe, but you'll get a bit fatigued. They're not special as they once were before, but maybe that's not their prerogative. But now there's more news that Sakai and Nike are bringing out another, um, version of the sakai and L sakai ld waffle this one is in all black with i think some uh nice leather acetones out so yeah so it thinks black you got black leather black nubok and a kind of what do you call that nylon sort of like puff it's the material that you'd get on this on the tongue is basically applied on the toe box and all the way around it. it looks pretty cool um it's rumored to come out when's it rumored to come out here uh copper drop uh it's written in french for some reason i don't know why but when's meant to drop out we don't have any details here about it but yeah a special one's on its way all black it looks pretty cool but this is not all black it's black apple with a white midsole which is kind of my perfect combination of all black shoe maybe a white swoosh would have been pretty cool but maybe that's similar to what already they brought out before we might see this in the runway show recently and again it's got the nakai nike and sakai on the back of the hill tab as well pretty interesting again maybe a bit fatigued by it maybe a bit bored and a bit over it but again you know nike have the tendency to do this and they have really nice thick nylon laces as well but i don't know are you a bit bored by these um, sakai and ld waffles yet or is it just me i think i'm a bit bored by them already i think they were special when i first saw them you know the stacked soles the the, everything is kind of stacked and put together in a weird kind of way similar to what you might see on the triple s but let's go triple s's but now that shape and that you know it's the the kind of not shock value but the appeal of it's kind of worn off over time maybe it's just me i don't know i'm a bit over them really i'm not sure what to think about them really but again black and white trainers you know i'm always down for but i'm not sure if i'm down to wear these right now especially once everyone has them but maybe it's just my sneaker hipster coming out in it who knows you have my nose yet Oh, God. Doesn't end, did it? Doesn't end. Anyway, next on the list, we have JME is going to drop a new album, man. JME's teasing a new album. Um, it's called Grime MC. 
what we're expecting it's called Grammar and C, and he's doing it an, 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 uh, a different kind of way. It seems as if he's going to drop physical releases first at in store events around the UK, a couple at Rough Trade East, which I'm t- hopefully going to go to. And in order to attend, you have to buy, uh, I think, the LP or the vinyl, which is a pretty cool way of doing it. You know, Jamie is, is as old school as it comes. You know, he was at the inception of Grime, he's a staple of the industry. Um, his last album that came, I forgot the name of it, was really good as well. I really enjoyed it. One with his face on the front, that was really cool. Um, so I'm interested to hear what Grime MC sounds like, but it's an interesting rollout. You don't really hear people doing this sort of stuff, like, you know, cutting a dub plate or cutting, a, cutting some vinyl, um, which looks really cool as well, actually. It's got his whole entire face on the front of it uh, with a clear plastic sleeve. And this video basically details... Um, I think the, the video is basically playing some of the tracks from the album in the background, and he's essentially, um, with a bit of chalk, next to the uh, turntable writing down all the dates of his kind of events that are coming up which is a really cool way of kind of rolling out the entire thing he's a cool dude anyway because he does everything to, you know he kind of you know walks a beat of his own drum and stuff he doesn't have any doesn't seem like he has any record industry pressure i'm not sure if he's still independent at the moment but yeah he's always done stuff really differently in a really unique way and it's cool to see him kind of continuing that and i'm interested to see what the album sounds like is it going to be a quintessential grime album back to front is it going to be testing or experimenting with new sounds who's going to be on the album what kind of features are we going to see um, that'd be cool to hear as well and also what are the performances going to look like in terms of him performing at these in-store events will it just be him on a microphone shouting or will it be like an actual set where he invites local DJs to come play with him I'm interested to see what's going to happen or just a massive fucking you know cypher of loads of you know local kids playing as well but yeah big up him man doing a damn thing let's read some of the details actually below this says uh da 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 um, in the background, various tracks birth the project. It can be heard, namely Nang featuring Skepta and You Watch Me. The dates listed are record shops that will see the sell of the album in limited quantities. World have listing listen sessions. So yeah, interesting way to do it, isn't it? That has, that's the whole album track list with no features listed, and also a list of dates of where it's going to be performing. Um, but yeah, so imagine doing that that way, activating it first in store with actual physical releases, and then dropping it later on streaming platforms. I think that's a really cool way to do things, man. Big up, big up uh, Jamie and everything that he's doing. So I recommend you check it out. Again, the video's pretty cool. He's got quite a good handwriting, isn't it, Jamie? To be honest. Very legible. Yeah, really cool. Recommend you check it out. Keep an eye out for it. When's it due to come out? Uh, the date here is... When's it due? Well, I guess when he goes starts performing, right? Oh, we don't, we don't have any idea of when it's going to actually release on digital streaming platforms, but the first performance is going to be at the Banquet Records on the 29th of november 5th of november at rough trade east and then from there he goes to hmv glasgow liverpool manchester uh sheffield but and birmingham so yeah good good little deal there man he's probably helping um hmv stay afloat as well i wonder how many kids actually go to hmv these days but yeah re- reckon recommend checking it out man grab mc from jme da, da, da. next on the list here what do we have let's move on uh mm. Yeah, have you, have you heard about Beck's new album coming out? He's got some tracks produced by Pharrell on it. I'm interested to hear what that's going to sound like. Um, won't play on here, obviously, because I don't want to get um, demonetized, but definitely keep an eye on that one. Beck, comes some, Beck again gets a bad rap in it because he tends to always get nominated for Grammys and clean them up consistently, but he's, you know, objectively, he does make some really good pop tracks, so I'm interested to hear what that sounds like and hear what edits he has because he does some really good remixes too he does send out remix he does send out records to some prominent people to remix you might hear like a good jansen remix or stuff that might sound really cool so i'm gonna keep an eye out for that one um we have some what else we have on here babylon record actually let's go to a list of stuff actually i think the rest of it we are kind of aware of what's going on oh the instagram lights is going to be rolling out worldwide too we've heard here what is he talking about da, da, da. Yeah, so we don't really hear about that. We've already spoken about Instagram likes. We have already been rinsed into that topic. So let's move on to the stuff I have on my list. And then we can carry on with our lives. Um, oh, Taylor Swift is annoying. Yeah, this is a this is something that um, I'm really struggling to kind of understand what is actually going on here, whether or not Taylor Swift is playing the victim or whether that she's a, a victim of, you know, some um, industry bullying or whatever she's calling it. So... Some background of the story. I'm sure you guys are aware with there's a little there's some static between Taylor Swift and Kanye West. I think it starts from right. Maybe that's where the static starts from. 
obviously Kanye West has that infamous moment where he goes on stage and quote unquote robs Taylor Swift of a moment by saying that Beyonce deserved the award for video of the year that 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 year during the UVMAs. The backlash from that, you know, Pink calls him a fucking idiot, whatever she did. You know, people hate Kanye as they do. He got cancelled for another time. Um, and then, you know, that's when the static started between him and Taylor Swift. Eventually they get they, they become friends again or become amicable. But I think in between that period, her and Kim Kardashian share a bit of jibes here and there. Some in you some so you know, some um some jabs get thrown left, right, and center. And then I'm pretty sure just before is it famous, the track famous where he has where Kanye has all those wax figurines in bed. I think Kanye has a line about Taylor Swift. Um Kim Kardashian secretly records that phone call. He calls Taylor Swift on loudspeaker, tells her she's gonna be in the in the track. He mentions it in there. Doesn't maybe detail exactly what he says, but kind of details that he kind of mentioned her in the track and just to kind of give her a heads up, the track drops. And then Taylor Swift decides to play the victim, saying that she's been sexually deva i don't know she said something about being you know um stripped naked and her integrity being taken away kim kardashian obviously um takes that as an affront don't you dare say that to my husband she releases the footage of the actual taylor swift phone call tip attack goes on that's one bit of the drama then the scooter braun thing i'm not too sure what's happening there but or where the beef started from i know why taylor swift doesn't like him anymore now but where the beef started from i'm pretty sure maybe it had something to do with the fact that scooter braun was kanye's ex-manager and maybe she thought she maybe went to Scooter Braun to tell Kanye to chill. Scooter Braun probably said, hey, it's not my business. Or something happened along those lines. And she probably maybe felt Scooter Braun was siding with Kanye, not with her. I don't know, something along those kind of lines. But whatever happened, um, Scooter Braun got into a position where he was able to buy the record label that um, Taylor Swift originally produced police her music on. I think the first few albums, maybe up until 2017 or something like that, um, which, which is essentially the main chunk of where Taylor Swift was able to make most of her money and become the big pop star that we know nowadays, right? So a really big, hefty catalogue. So the word on the internet is that um, this record label, I think Big Machine is the record label it's called, the the original owner of this record label offered, um, the mast, offered Taylor Swift her masters. To, to purchase them back from him right but but it seems like taylor swift said no so either she said no because she wanted to move on and she didn't want anything to do with this guy or this label because she had a bad experience with him because maybe he's he's close to scooter braun or maybe taylor swift said no because even though she's a mega pop star she's maybe not as cash rich as we all think she is right she might not have that much money she might have been signed to a 360 she might make all her money from touring and even if you tour a lot there's still only one of you right there's not a lot of kind of you know different revenue streams coming in there so she might not have had the money um to hand in cash to maybe purchase her masters and then as as um fate would uh as fate would kind of enlist um scooter braun then sweeps along and decides to buy that record label including all taste with masters which is you know a really really big coup and maybe in the frame in a kind of you know when you're looking at it objectively maybe it might have been a bit of a middle finger about the Taylor Swift because they've got beef going on but I don't know but the plain facts are Taylor Swift's masters were available to purchase Taylor Swift said no I'm not going to purchase them Scooter Braun comes and purchase them everything's all well and good isn't it right but somehow within all of this drama Taylor Swift has somehow tried to play the victim and tried to make it seem as if she's being bullied and on paper it just looks like a straight business though it looks like somebody had the money to buy them you couldn't buy them and now they are doing what anyone would do if they bought something and it's now the intellectual property. They're protecting it, right? It's now Scooter Braun's intellectual property. So it's, it's within his best interest to do what's best for his intellectual property because he wants to make money off it. So why would he allow Taylor Swift to go and use or license the material without paying accordingly like anyone else, right? Even if you made it, it doesn't matter anymore, right? Um, um, and now um, Taylor Swift put out this massive statement essentially kind of playing the victim and crying. And I'm not too sure what to think of it. I'm not too sure whether I believe Taylor do I believe Scooter Braun, or whether or not this is just an indication of how fucked up the record industry is, right? Whereas, you know, why is it that you make something and suddenly, in record industry, it's the only place that's like that, right? Where suddenly, the moment you make something and you get signed to a label, your percentage or your, your ownership pie do it like kind of shrinks every time that you basically add another person to contribute or to basically help out. They basically take a chunk. Oh, so don't, they're like, you know... Um, don't worry, I, I don't need any money from it. Imagine you make a hit record. Don't worry, I don't need any money from it. Just give me a bit of your, a bit of your masters, a bit of your kind of um, ownership of the of the actual song. And then by the time this song actually blows up, you don't recoup anything, and the other people recoup more of it. You end up with like forty percent, maybe less than forty percent of the ownership of the actual record. So let's read Taylor Swift's statement, then we can talk about it on the other side. So this is Taylor Swift's um, statement. She made a tweet, I think, just the other day about it, right? Um, 
so it says the following um the actual tweet is like I, I don't know what else to do right so she's essentially saying you know I've, I've exhausted all the options privately and now i'm having to go to social media and beg my fans other celebrity um um out there to kind of you know fight my fight for me which is you know is what it is so it starts off with guys it's been announced recently that the american music awards will be honoring me with the artist of the decade award at this year's ceremony cool amazing right i've been planning to perform a medley of all my hits throughout the decade on the show Scott Borchetta and Scooter Braun have now said that I will not be allowed to perform my old songs on television because they claim that would be re-recording my music before I'm allowed to next year. Additionally, this isn't the only way I had planned to telling you this news. Netflix has created a documentary about my life for the past few years. Scott and Scooter have declined to use the use of my older music or performances footage from this project, even though there is no mention of either of them or Big Machine Records anywhere in the film. Scott Borchetta told my team that they'll allow me to use my music only if I do these things. If I agree not to re-record copycat versions of my songs next year, which is something I both legally allowed to do and looking forward to. Okay, yeah, this is something that she threatened to do, I think, when Scooter Braun signed her masters or got her masters. Like, oh, don't worry, they're valueless. Anyway, I'm just going to go re-record all my old hits and put them out again. Which is a bit silly because, you know, it, she's, if she thinks she's going to get the same reach us it depends really, isn't it? Maybe Tessu's fans are fucking psychos, but it's not going to hit the same. You're not going to get the same... Maybe she's just doing it in terms of revenue stream because if she releases them self tight on her own kind of label, she'll probably get all the income, which is probably more than what she would have got previously. But again, it's a it's a, it's a really laborious task to do anyway in the beginning. It might be something cool to say out loud, but to go back and re record her entire catalog. She's one of the weird pop stars that actually has, like, if you go on her um, on Spotify and you go on all the, like, the plays and all her songs and her albums, she's one of the rare pop stars where. A lot of the tracks I've got, you know, millions and millions of, of fucking listens. It's not as if, like, she's only got five quote-unquote singles that people like. The majority of the album is, like, you know, right up Taylor Swift fans alley. Like, they love everything about her. So it's going to be a real, real slog to get that done. But again, you know, maybe she's that pissed off with them, she'll do it. Um, so she says, yeah, if I agree, she's, they, they told them she's only allowed to use the songs if she agrees not to re-record it. What she says, she's both allowed to do legally. And also... Uh, told my team that I need to stop talking about him and Scooter Braun. I feel very strongly about sharing what is happening to me could change the awareness level of other artists and partnerships and part especially help avoid these similar fate. The message being sent out to me is very clear. Basically, be a good little girl and shut up or you'll be punished, which is not true, really. She's, again, she's conflating two issues there. I think there's a personal issue there on there and obviously an issue with the record industry. But what it seems like to me is that the record industry is broken in terms of the ownership, right? Uh, 360 deals, <coughs> um, labels trying to dip in and take money out of your live shows. Um, your masters being held by a label indefinitely and you don't be able to get them back. Like essentially, that's your intellectual property and you're signing it away because most artists in the beginning have little to no resources or money and they need a basically an advance or a loan from the record label in order to record songs, get features, fly, perform, um, you know, get a wardrobe, makeup, whatever it may be, just to kind of live the artist lifestyle. They use that money as a loan. But then the, uh, the label, of course, uh, get the money on the back end through the release of the music. And sometimes an artist, you sometimes maybe don't think long term. You don't maybe think you're going to be that big of a star. You blow up. You're then seeing less money coming in for your album sales and suddenly you kind of, you know, your hands in there exasperated. But I think what needs to happen in general is that nowadays, especially from here interviews with Russ and stuff, there's no real excuse for an artist nowadays to sign away all their masters or to sign away their rights or to give permission to the label to do whatever they want with their likeness. You have to be cognitive and aware that maybe taking the hit in the beginning, maybe tightening your belt, maybe working part time, saving money, maybe doing a crowdfunding thing, launching a Kickstarter, having a Patreon. Somehow that would allow you not to kind of take a loan from a record company as long as basically withholding taking money from record label as long as you can so that when you finally do have a record label agreement you have that thing which they call a partnership which is essentially you maybe licensing um the label to release one album or signing on for a couple of albums or whatever it may be just to get the bag which is completely different for signing your life away to a record label having them sign you lock you down for five albums on a one million dollar deal but then in year two you end up you know far exceeding um that that one million dollar deal cap and you end up being the biggest star in the world suddenly now those terms are making sense but you're locked in a contract so it's just a question of patience and obviously on taylor swift's side of it it also shows that she's a mega mega star she's one of the biggest stars in the world pop star out of this world right and essentially she didn't have the money didn't have the cash to buy her own masters which again is a indictment on her as well because 
why wouldn't you buy your own masters? Why wouldn't you, even if it's your enemy holding them, why wouldn't you want to make a deal with them to get your masters back so that you don't have to deal with those guys ever again? Now she's kind of going on social media and trying to make it seem as if they did some backhanded thing. They didn't do anything backhanded. One guy wanted to sell a record label that had your masters on it. He offered it to you. You didn't buy it. And then some other guy that you don't like bought it. It's just, that's the nature of business. And now he's looking up his intellectual property. I don't see anything wrong with that personally. Um, Anyway, she continues. This is wrong. Neither of these men had a hand in writing these songs. Again, the inclusion of men. She's trying to make it into some sort of weird gender feminist battle, which it obviously isn't. It's really bizarre to say these sort of things. How many clients does Stuart Scooter Braun has? How many clients have you Scooter Braun have that are female? Do you think Scooter Braun would really to exist in this industry being some misogynistic pig that goes after, um, you know, unsuspecting artists and hoovers up all their masters? It makes no sense. You just didn't do your business properly. You know what I mean? It's just your, it's just your, it's, it's, a, it's, it's her issue, her business. She's trying to make it a business of everyone else, really. Her business argument is a bit shit for somebody as popular as her, it seems like, right? Uh, please let Scott Porchetta and Scooter Ball know how you feel about this. Gaslighting people, um, setting a mob on them, which is really, really bad. Um, Scooter also manages several artists who I really believe care about other artists and their work. Please ask them for help with this. I'm hoping that maybe they can talk to some sense into the men who are exercising tyrannical control over someone who just wants to play music she wrote. Dude, why don't you buy the music back yourself then? I don't, I don't understand what this complaint is about. This is insane. Or license is license it off Scooter Braun like just be a grown up why is she complaining on, on social media it's about something that is her business I especially um, I'm especially asking for help from the Carlisle group who put up um, the money for the sale of my music to his two men I just want to be able to perform my own music that's it I've tried to work this out privately through my team but I have not been able to resolve anything right now my performance at the VMA is an Netflix documentary and any other recorded events I'm planning to play until 2020 are a question mark I love you guys and thought you should know what's going on Taylor of course now she's kind of pressurizing her fans and guilt tripping them saying look if you want me to perform I've got loads of stuff planned between now and November 2020, a whole year's worth of content. I won't be able to do it unless these guys give me back my masters. What did she expect them to do? To sign over her masters to her with no fee? Like, just give them back to her? Like, with no, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any business sense whatsoever. Scooter Braun paid for them. If you want them back, you have to pay, pay him for them as well. Or maybe he just doesn't want to sell them, which is he's perfectly willing to, he's perfectly within his rights to do as well. If this goes to court, it's going to get thrown out, which is why she's probably resolving to this kind of, social media pressure thing because if they guess like the, the business is done legitimately it sounds like by the sounds of it but again maybe it just highlights in general issues in the red coin industry where artists are so willy-nilly and okay with just signing their life away and i never really got that understand again maybe it comes from my experience having seen a lot of the early grime guys struggling to release music and struggling to gain any kind of traction in the commercial world now is it's the best time to be a uk rapper right because you know labels in the uk are kind of you know falling over themselves to sign anyone on grime daily and stuff but back in the day they were seen as the dregs of the music industry right no one wanted to kind of acknowledge them um the lightning rod moment was obviously when Dizzy Rascal won the Mercury Prize Award for Boy, Boy in the Corner. That kind of changed everything for the most part. But, you know, a lot of the, you know, even Roll Deep, Wiley suffered from the whole signing into a record label, having to produce corny bubblegum tunes. Uh, Skepta had, had an issue with that as well at some point. Um, but nowadays, artists don't have any excuse for signing life the way. You know what is, you know what the deal was with three sixty deals. You know what record labels are in. Record labels are in the, in the business of serving themselves, not serving the artists. So you have to be very aware of it. So for Taylor Swift to use social media to kind of cajole her fan base to essentially pressurize another dude to sell her masters back to her, even though she was given the opportunity to buy them herself, is really out of hand. But maybe I don't know what is going on, and I'm a bit mistaken. So if, if anyone wants to clear it up for me, feel free. But it seems like Taylor Swift is really out of pocket for this one in that respect but i don't know maybe i'm wrong who knows but if you check it out it's going to keep rumbling on and on we're not going to see the end of this we're probably going to hear from justin bieber very soon because he's you know he's a ride or die scooter brown guy um but yeah really weird situation man very very strange um taylor swift sounds annoying anyway in general man she sounds like a fucking nightmare to deal with in general absolute headache but anyway what can you do um let's move on let's move on lakeith stanfield makes a good point about uh what you call it black media entertainment channels and shit this is a beef that i didn't see occurring but this um so lakeith smith famously from get out has been has had a bit of a fraught relationship with black media or black hip-hop media websites i remember him going on breakfast chat on a breakfast uh club and having a bit of a clash with um charlamagne because i think he did a little freestyle and charlamagne basically said it was shit and they had a really frosty um interaction there but in 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 general when he goes on these um black 
radio stations. He seems he seems to have his back up, or seems to have a chip on his shoulder. He seems maybe because he knows they're going to get into some foolishness, and he doesn't seem like he really enjoys interviews anyway. For the most part, if you've seen his other interviews, he's usually fucking around, playing a character, you know, just you know, just being his eccentric self. Um, so it's no surprise that he'd make this point. But I think <clears throat> the point he's making, regardless of how what you think of him as a person, is legitimate and has some kind of credence. So especially when you think about people like Wendy Williams, I've never really been the biggest fan of gossip-based black entertainment websites. Anyway, I think for me in general, I think there was an issue in the beginning of black entertainment where it felt as if the mainstream media wasn't giving some of our favorite artists the credit or the coverage that they deserved. So in an, in an effort to kind of fill that gap some of the more entrepreneurial people within the black media space decided to copy some of the um some of the most some of the lowest common denominator websites or media sites out there and try and make their version of it mostly the gossip ones and um they thought that was the best way to kind of gain traction and it probably was right i think those gossip channels or the gossip platforms as de as deplorable as they may be the message they send out and what kind of actions they kind of um indirectly reinforce they have done a good thing in terms of being able to be a platform to showcase some of the more lesser known entities in you know in the black media scape for instance like i don't think uh, love and hip-hop would be as big or as maybe well regarded as it is now if it wasn't as covered you know as extensively as it has done as it has been on the shade room and boss and those kind of places it's allowed a person that was on love and hip-hop to basically be on the same platform as like you know your jay-z and shit. even though they're not even the same stratosphere but those platforms allow them to occupy the same sort of space but obviously, those platforms are primarily driven by gossip. That's what it's, that's what basically drives interaction, right? Someone getting into a fight, um, slanging match on the comments, um, you know, indirects through tweets and whatever and captions and all that stuff, like um, compromising images. Those are the things that really gain traction and really gain and really kind of pique the interest of some of the readers on these websites. And I think without them realizing, they sub they kind of subconsciously reinforce. Um, negative stereotypes or they sometimes encourage weird behavior because people are trying to act out so that some even subconsciously even if they're not aware of it they're trying to act out so they can get on those pages and there's nothing worse or nothing there's a no bigger example of that than when wendy williams right she's essentially i think in my opinion one of the most deplorable characters in the black media space right she spends she has a, a TV show where she essentially sits down and talks about everyone else's business, sometimes very disparagingly. Stuff that she said about Meghan Markle and all that stuff is really, really disgusting. Um, she obviously did that thing with Method Man and his wife when she was going through battling that cancer issue that was really deplorable. Um, she's just been a really scummy person. If you're aware of who she is prior to the radio days when she used to present with Charlemagne, you'd know that she was a very um, confrontational and nasty, catty person. But somehow, I'm not sure what happened, maybe it's the power of Hollywood, she somehow been able to reinvent herself as some kind of, you know, a merry, fairy godmother of celebrity gossip and news. And people are now actively going to her to kind of tell their side of the story, which I've never really agreed with either because she's not somebody that you can ever trust. She'd be somebody that could easily throw you under the bus and reveal secrets about you that you would never, you would never have kind of assumed would happen. And just a very scummy person, kind of the kind of the, the bottom, you know, the dregs of it. And if you look at some of the guests on her show, you can see that some of the top tier artists that we kind of all respect would never set foot on her stage or on her couch, innit? Because, you know, they don't want to be associated with it whatsoever. And I think other stations too, Hot 97, have been guilty of it. You know, they sometimes exploited the inner conflicts within some of their own presenters for views online, which has been disgusting. The Breakfast Club, of course, early Charlemagne was very much so in that lane of making sure he said the most crazy and divisive thing in order to kind of um, elicit a reaction. And now he's kind of, you know, co-opted his whole mental health, um, you know, black love, black men don't cheat persona. But, you know, we all know where he's come from. So we know these platforms are, you know, by and large, for the most part, very much so it reinforced negative stereotypes also not a really good platform for artists or entertainers or public figures to go and really talk about their work it's usually mostly talking about drama and you know it's no slight on them everyone's got their thing to do but if you say it out loud and you call it out trying to now defend yourself and make it seem as if what that person's saying is irrelevant doesn't make any sense either but let's read what um lakeith statement said so lakeith um uh, sorry, Lakeith Stanfield made an Instagram post detailing his basic dissatisfaction with these platforms. And he said the following um, It's a fact, this is caption, right? It's a fact that a lot of these platforms, the Shade Room, Lipstick Alley, Breakfast Club, World Star, and many others, um, uh, are usually or tend to be feeding 
grounds for negative reinforcement towards black nonconformists. They bolster faux vanity, hold a white supremacist scope over black men and women, often highlighting negative attributes and downplaying mind expanding one, which is very true, right? It's like, you know, you don't, how many times have you watched the Breakfast Club interview, scroll down to the comments and see people say, oh, wow, this is a really good interview for once, right? And why do people say that? Because for the most part, most interviews have to do with, you know, who's someone fucking, who they're not with together anymore, the money they lost, drugs, some pregnancy thing. It's always kind of messy stuff, always kind of really personal stuff, not a lot of stuff to do with the albums. Sometimes, the only times you see a really kind of considered interviews where they actually go in depth and kind of try and understand the, the you know, the frame of mind that person had when they're making that particular track is when they're interviewing OGs, right? That's when a lot of respect is kind of due on there. Um, an example would be um, the interview Hot 97 had with Kano, one of the most disrespectful interviews you've seen in a long time, right? Ebro's very well known for always kind of letting the artist know, the guest know that he didn't listen to the album. Um, and it was kind of just, you know, no one in that room did any research on who Kano was, any kind of idea of what his influence is or where his standing is in the, you know, in, in the UK music scene, which would have taken just a couple of Googles. It's not anything, you know, you don't have to watch tons of documentaries or dig into forums. A couple of Google searches, you would understand what Kano's place is in the whole um, um, UK music scene is. But instead, they kind of, you know, reduced it to the common denominator, started making some cheesy, corny English, London, UK slang jokes and all that malarkey. And eventually just turned it, it just devoid of any kind of relevance. The interview was a bit uh, banal and a little bit empty. So it's you wouldn't be remiss if you're okay to say that, you know, I'm not going to appear on these things again if they're not going to research me or have any kind of knowledge of what I'm doing. So again, pointing out isn't a big deal. But of course, you know, Charlemagne the God decided to kind of jump on Breakfast Club and argue his point and basically say that Lakeith Stansfield is essentially, what is he doing? He essentially shucks and jives for the white man, but then he's quick to kind of point out the errors of his own black community, which is kind of crazy, to be honest. I think he made a good point. I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, again, I think maybe Charlemagne's reaction to La La uh, Lakeith Stansfield's quirkiness and his kind of quirky traits and how he conducts himself in interviews and kind of shock and awe of it is, again, an indication as to why Lakeith Stansfield was making a good, good point. But I think in general now, these sites make themselves, they make too much money spreading American negative stereotypes to stop it. But I also think it's an opportunity for somebody out there to provide a platform that actually, you know when um, so you were in DJ Booth first started and it was like, everyone was like hyped about it because there were actually writers on DJ Booth who sounded like they were fans of music and they listened to albums and they gave really good considered feedback and they were interviewing artists with a lot of love and appreciation. Remember that thing? That was a big deal. Why? Because for the most part, most of the websites are just like, you know, empty vessels of fucking bullshit, like empty, you know what I mean? Like, like genius, for instance, right? No real substance behind everything they write and just, you know, throw away articles that, you know, no one will give a shit about after you've read them for a couple of minutes. But I wish we had more platforms like early DJ Booth, maybe on social media that were able to kind of expand more on people's business acumen, talk about talk about Tyler, the creator's investments and his store and his new collection, ask him about the inspiration about his new shoes, talk about rocky and what he's done sonically and how he thinks has influenced a new generation like actually talk about the craft of what these people are doing the impact they have on culture and not talk about the messy personal stuff because what i realize especially the older you get everyone's got their issues everyone's got their problems everyone's going through shit so to kind of waste your time sitting there talking to an artist who's one of the only like there's not a lot of people who are able to kind of um traverse that long and windy road to success right your what you're kind of you know, within the, the, the point decimal percent of people who are successful. To waste your time sitting there um, trying to understand why their baby mother's freaking out online instead of talking about their creative work is a waste of time because you can get that story for somebody else. We've all got friends in our circle that are going through crazy relationship stuff. Why not spend your time, you know, advising your friends who are close to you, who have you have some kind of insight on, or maybe just don't care about, or maybe just do what normal people should be doing and mind your own business. Use the time when you've got an artist in front of you to talk about their art, to talk about what went into it, because those are more interesting. Maybe talk about some issues that are going on in the world and get a perspective about things. That's of more interest as opposed to sitting down there and talking again. And it just, it's an, even the Joe Biden podcast, for instance, when they talk about relationship stuff, I skip super fast. Like, uh, women, men and women stuff, it's just boring. Like, who cares? We all go through that stuff. We're going through it personally ourselves. To talk about it again and again, it's just so nauseating. It's probably people probably are tuning out or back chat and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's just, you know, the same old fucking topics, you know, oh, would you date somebody that's shorter? Do girls need to have money? It's just like, fucking hell, who cares about this shit? Let's talk about the art. Let's talk about culture. Let's actually try and move things forward. And <clears throat> which is probably why people like Kanye like to sit down with people like Zane Lowe, because you know, you're going to get 
even though that whole interview was a bit softball, the whole interview for the most part, the majority interview concerned his investments, his ideas around design, his perspective on music, and just generally him talking about his artistry. That was what, it, there were times that he was defending himself about this, you know, his stances and things, but that was the majority of the interviews that Zane Lowe does are, consi- are concentrated about the music. The artist must appreciate. I'm sure people in the industry appreciate it too because, you know, their clients are able to go into an interview and not be made to sweat, you know, under their collar because the interviewer is asking them about some person they fucked back in the day. It doesn't make any sense. So for Charlamagne to sit there and defend those actions obviously proves that, you know, you know someone's coming at your basically livelihood because, you know, without the gossip, without all that innuendo, what does he really have? No, actually, you know what? That's the, that's the shame. That's the kind of disappointing thing about someone like Charlamagne or these kind of websites. When they want to, they can actually provide really wholesome content um didn't thingy majiggy didn't um what's his name look at the example that Charlemagne had with the gucci man interview apart from the last 10 50 minutes where gucci man goes you know off the rails and start attacking angela yee that whole interview was really good right gucci man opened up he spoke about him his influence on the culture he spoke about him like his rehabilitation you know his his perspective on life now how he he's he's um actually towards music we've got a little jewel about gucci man saying that you know he would he would much rather his favorite artists make loads of music that's his perspective he likes to drop as much stuff as he can because he knows his fans are going to appreciate it and if other people don't appreciate it they're not his fans so it doesn't really matter like really cool information that we got from him all because Charlamagne decided to have some research um and really got involved so that he can do that interview but he decides to do the other interview about you know sucking farts out of people's butts and you know um asking um <clears throat> who's the guy asking that actor that's on the godfather of harlem why his eye is droopy like who does that like who asks those kind of interviews this this kind of question somebody well why would you would you ask your your friend just in the, in the middle of a party like i don't know what's wrong with your eye or what happened to your lip or you know or whatever like it's just really strange and really kind of again lacking any kind of um i don't know just politeness and stuff it just doesn't make any sense and then you complain when those same artists decide you know what i'm gonna go for a softball interview somewhere else i don't blame them or just don't talk at all and just put your artwork out there so again an odd beef <clears throat> one you wouldn't thought would happen but makes sense you know the beef's been rumbling for a while since that freestyle but again i'm with lakeith smith on this um the the the, the more i'm uh, sorry lakeith stanfield the more light we kind of uh, shine on this hopefully we have a reaction and some kid out there decides to make a platform where it's all about the art it's all about the artistry it's all about the person what they're making and it's less about all this like dumb dumb random shit that we don't need to know about but yeah maybe that's just me who knows anyway that's an hour thanks so much for tuning in um the xeno zinger show episode number 252 um as per usual check out my website xenozinger.com for more information regarding what i'm doing this is probably the last one for the for the week or for the weekend so definitely um enjoy your weekend if whatever you're doing all that stuff um, check out my website if you're watching via youtube give me a thumbs up maybe subscribe if you want to come back and check out some more content if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five star review so people can find the show and obviously if you have any questions feel free to email me but be- but until then yeah until then until then take care and be safe bye peace peace peace